Juan, Carmen Montesinos, uh, San Sanhuesa. Thank you so much for, for taking the time. I know these are interesting, difficult days for all of us. And um, as I was sharing with you, um, the intention of this archive is just to keep a record of our emotions, feelings, thoughts as uh, the COVID-19 crisis is unfolding. So thank you for your time. Um, I wanted to first um, ask you to please give us a little bit about your background. So those, those that are not familiar with your work to become familiar with some of it and where are you at? You're in, in um, Valparaiso, a wonderful Valparaiso, right? Yes. Well, actually I live in, in a, a small town north of Valparaiso, which is called Concon. It's, it used to be like a little fishing village. Um, and then over time it's become sort of a commuter uh, town for people who work in Valparaiso and uh, Viña del Mar, which are like neighboring cities. And I work in Valparaiso, but I live like uh, 15 kilometers north of Valparaiso. North of Valparaiso. Very, very nice. It sounds like uh, the true Paraiso and then Oh. The other side. <laughs> Actually, I, instead of having the camera look at me, I should have a camera pointing at the ocean view that I have a beautiful view of the ocean and then Valparaiso is on the back. It's like a, it's a bay so I can see Valparaiso behind. It, it is just the pain of the confinement, I, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so where are you working? I know you are you are the um, the director for for Líderes Educativos, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, it's interesting because I, um, for many many years, I've worked in teacher education, and I did quite a bit of work uh, looking at um, how to best prepare teachers uh, to work and, um, and serve children who are most disfranchised. Um, do through uh, economic exclusion mm -hmm. uh, or you know, race um, discrimination or inequities in general. And in doing that work, I realized that school principals were key to creating conditions for teachers to engage in equity education. So I ended up sort of over the years working with more with principals um, and school leaders in general and teacher leaders uh, as sort of a, a, the, the, the stage in which the, the work that we do at the university preparing teachers uh, must be sort of um, conducive to equity education. So right now I, I'm, I'm directing a center which is funded by a, state, a government grant mm -hmm. and it's a consortium of uh, four institutions uh, to um, prepare leaders for, for schools and leaders, you know, at, at all levels. Uh, we're working with school leaders, with uh, district level leaders, and we're working with uh, creating a lot of network leadership uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with the idea of uh, equipping um, school leaders and system level leaders with um, tools to create conditions for equitable learning. In the Absolutely. Yeah. And, and just thinking what you just said, how important it is to have the, the correct um, structure and support for teachers. So if you don't if you don't have that, then the teachers can be magnificent, but then education is not going to be the same. So working with the directors, with the principals, that makes a lot of sense. So, Carmen, mm -hmm. before the crisis hits, you're, you're, I imagine, giving workshops, working with instructors. I didn't know that you were doing also instruction in the classroom with students at the university. And, uh, no, I mean, I, uh, it, my, my, my professorship job, I'm a, I'm a professor of psychology, and I worked um, with... Uh, undergraduate psychology students. In mm. Chile, when you go to the university, uh, you become a licensed psychologist. So it's really a professional preparation. And yeah. I was working with them in the area of um, educational psychology. And, um, and mostly we were uh, you know, working with them to be able to support teachers and understand what happens in the classroom. Because, you know, it's as, a, as sort of a 
creating sort of interdisciplinary work in schools is very important because you know one of the things that we know is that children come to school uh, whole and parts of their lives are not uh, conducive to their learning yeah. so yeah. expecting teachers to be able to be social workers psychologists and so forth you know it's not going to work so so mm -hmm. teachers can really focus on on their job which is to help kids learn mm -hmm. they need to also be supported by um, sort of other professionals so i, I work with in, in developing um, psychologists who are able to understand the classroom from the perspective of the teachers and then yeah. help teachers meet yeah. their goals rather than thinking that the problem is in the kid and they have to pull the kid out and fix the kid but it's really understanding it more as an ecology yeah. of, in the classroom yeah so um mid mid-march that's when you're going to lockdown in chile or, or how did the the whole crisis uh on, on unfolding in chile are well, you curfew it, right now mm -hmm. actually it was my birthday the day i turned oh. <laughs> Happy the day birthday. 55 is when all hell broke loose as we would say and so i was like wow you know if i i entered like the senior citizen phase and <laughs> this is what happens you know i there's a perk because you know at the beginning they said okay people who are 65 and older have to stay home so you know i was able to stay home mm -hmm. um and it's it, the beginning was i mean even right now in 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 terms of um where i live it's it's um not mandatory lockdown but in other parts of chile is it is mandatory but then schools were canceled because of the parents were afraid to send their kids to school uh there's also a liability i mean if all these people get sick at the university so the university uh, canceled classes and told us uh, to stay home mm -hmm. just because it was, um, you know, the, the, they complied with the um, government request that the social distancing and all that. So we pretty much, I, the last time I went to work was, you know, as I say, the day of my birthday when um, wow. we were told to go home. So I've been at home since. <laughs> I think to remember, right? <laughs> My yeah. goodness. <laughs> so of, of the um like how's education doing in chile then these days is are, are things stopped and, and and idle or have people been able to continue training well, students it's been quite interesting because at the beginning it was like you know a few days a few weeks i would say that nothing was happening and then the the government started to say, okay, we're going to do online classes. So they develop all kinds of resources for teachers to do online classes. And quickly it was realized that the inequities are there. So the kids who were able to use all these platforms and all these social, uh, you know, uh, media and, and work uh, remotely were the kids who came from middle class or affluent families and the children who lived in the shanty towns, uh, who lived in very crowded conditions, uh, they couldn't do it. And even if they had a computer, if you had five kids, they couldn't be all at class at the same time. So, you know, in order for this, for this to really work, you needed a family in which uh, everybody had their own computers because the parents at the same time were working remotely on their computers. So yeah. it became a mess. Yeah. So the government then decided that to go to put the schools on winter break so they they went for two weeks on break mm -hmm. you know from mm -hmm. i don't know what with the idea that when schools restart we wouldn't have to stop for winter break but it would, it would continue um through the year and um and it's been very difficult because on the one hand you know you have um the difficulties of ensuring that everybody access the the online um, on the other hand schools um, are in Chile public schools depend on the municipal department of education uh -huh. so the every department every municipal department of education has also different capabilities for supporting the schools and the teachers so in some areas 
Uh, some municipalities, the municipality is very proactive, teachers are actually working mm -hmm. remotely, mm -hmm. they hold meetings and so forth and so forth. But in other areas, nobody answers the phone when you call and there's nobody there because they're remote town. So uh, some schools have been better able to provide what the government is, is offering and some teachers are, have been able to commit themselves to doing this. But yeah. what's interesting is that at the university level, uh -huh. um, the, uni the university, uh, all universities in Chile went online. So you're doing online classes. But students, you know, university students in Chile are very politically active. They went on, on strike. So we have an online strike. So, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, so, interesting. So, because students are actually complaining about this inequity. So students, students say, you know, yeah. um, you know, if, if you're, you know, you, you um, have children at home, you can't really say to the kids, okay, you get out of the way, I have to study now. So it's been, there are all these challenges that students are facing to access. Yeah. But the, yeah. so universities have given out computers, they've given like access to um, like a mobile, so that everybody can access, but even then students are complaining that this is not fair and that they, mm -hmm. and then they're, they're asking that their money, that they should not be charged tuition because they're not getting what they're paying for. Yeah. And this, whole, this big thing also with the private sector, we have about 7%, 7 of the students go to private schools. So yeah. the parents of these private schools are also complaining that they should not pay the fee and then the school saying, well, but if you don't pay, then we have to lay off teachers. So there's all this, you know, sort yeah. of change event. All these ramifications. So, so the whole question of how to provide education is really crossed by class, by socioeconomic status, by, um, but also rights and responsibilities and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know, uh, political wow. activism, you name it. Very complex. And Chile was having a difficult year as it is, right? The, the past year and this year were, were a little bit more difficult than years past in terms of well, social unrest, and right? Yeah, we had a, a terrible uh, social unrest that started October 18th. Mm -hmm. And it was, I mean, it was interesting because it was, uh, you. first of all, we classes were suspended because it was just dangerous to be on the street. There was too much rioting and you know and uh clashes with police it was it was really terrifying i mean i was caught in a public transportation and the the people in the on the streets were throwing stones at the bus and the driver was trying to you know and then there came the, sure. the water canyon and we were kind of caught in the middle so going out was very dangerous actually i was more stressed about that than um, um, about this because i think i have more control here because now I stay home and yeah. I know how to take care of myself. But yeah. at that time, so it was a very stressful end yeah. of the year. Uh -huh. And many universities um, had to, because the students were on strike through the social unrest, couldn't finish the second semester of 2019. So mm -hmm. they were starting 2020, finishing up 2019, 2019. online. And so some universities have not been able to start the academic year of 2020, which starts usually in March because they're completing the previous academic year because of the social unrest. So it's been a very difficult situation. In fact, wow. many schools are saying that public schools that last year, on average, they probably had maybe four months of classes. Wow. Less of the time was lost and wasted in, in riots and, and strikes and so forth. So actually COVID-19 is actually is just making it even more so complex, a situation that was already difficult, right, for teachers and students. Yeah, it, 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 it has, and, but I think it's sort of interesting because um, on the one hand, you know, the, the government didn't really have a good handle of how to deal with the riots, the social unrest. It was very, yeah. I mean, People really lost trust in the government, lost trust in, in the police, lost trust in, in the uh, legislation, etc. Uh, but the, 
from my perspective, and I think there, there's a certain consensus by a large majority that our government has been very skillful in managing the, the, the pandemic. Okay. We have very few deaths and, and, and the, the spread. Has yeah, been. the numbers are excellent compared to other countries. It's really yeah. enviable. Yeah, we, we, so, um, so that has restored sort of some confidence in the government. Right. And to what extent that confidence is going to um, spill into confidence about the social unrest and the, the inequities that gave rise to the uh, remains a question. So, yeah. Um, so, it, the teachers, fact, you, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say that, in fact, um, I was reading in the news that the social unrest started again. So, they're still there about a week ago, people are again going out to the street and, and mm -hmm. doing rioting and destroying property and looting and fires and so there's been clashes with the police so it's you know it seems like there's a concern that after the, the social distancing measures are lifted there will be there will even come social unrest yeah. because people you know a lot of people are going without you know hungry because there's been a lot of uh, layoffs and unemployment and yeah. we have a very large informal um labor market so a lot of people just you know they sell three lettuces on a corner in the street and with that they make enough money to buy some food for the exactly. day and then the next day they have to sell three more lettuces otherwise they don't eat yeah wow so i was going to ask you so uh but in terms of the students that you or and teachers that you have contact with uh, emotionally they they have to be in a in a difficult spot right now, right? Like, uh, how do you how do you gauge how they're like, the emotions that are out there among the educators? Well, I think it's what's interesting is that the, the 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 teachers, you know, some of them are um, again, it has to do with leadership and with opportunities that are created. Are trying to be very creative and are, are, are very willing to share what they're doing. So there's a lot of solidarity in terms of, of helping each other cope with this and create resources that, that I mean, that, and that's, that's really good. But on the other hand, you have the uh, teacher's union who is completely saying, you know, we're not gonna be part of this, you mm -hmm. know, this is um, not right, you know, we, and, and so, even if the government wants to return back to school and open schools, the teacher union is saying that we're not going to go back because it's not safe. So yeah. there's also sort of this, this sort of double thing. On the one hand, you have sort of the union, teachers union saying, you know, this is, we're not going to be part of whatever the government decides to go back if it's not safe. But on the yeah. other hand, you have the teachers also trying to, in their specific communities, um, trying to serve kids like for example teachers have what's called the ethical um turno which is sort of a like you know when you when you have a like you, you have to like in schools in the state you know you have to look over recess or something you know you're assigned to monitor uh -huh, uh -huh. so teachers here have uh, what they call ethical turns and so basically once a week they go to the school to serve food for kids because a lot of children in public schools here they get their meals at school uh -huh. so they have to go to school or they go to school to um you know provide uh, written uh, resources for children who cannot access internet so teachers are in in many schools are are working um and doing this ethical um sort of um duty uh -huh. Yeah, uh, to support kids on these other areas of particular of, of uh, feeding them. Wow! Yeah. So in in yeah, the socially uh, you have uh, you have a really complex um, um, scenario, right, with multiple um, situations and 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 economic difficulties that are going on. So I can see how teachers play a very important role. Um, and on that on that note, uh, the teachers are are 
it seems to me that in Chile there there was already quite a bit of an extended use of of uh, technologies for instruction, right? Like online is by no means something foreign to to teachers. So the transition right now yeah. to this moment maybe wasn't that difficult for some. Mm, I, I, I don't know, because in Chile, indeed, we do have a long history of um, developing sort of um, technology in schools, and, but, but they tended to be more like um, isolated, like there's a computer lab in the, in the school and, and kids will go to the computer lab and it's in, one teacher is in charge of that. It's not sort of embedded into everyday classroom instruction. Uh, mm -hmm. You will have things like um, PowerPoints or some sort of that kind of thing, but uh, everyday cl classroom instruction was not very um, digitalized. Yeah. So, but the but the the, the schools, the government has invested heavily in creating uh, this kind of uh, resources. For example, the government has invested heavily in developing um, professional development courses online, uh -huh. Uh -huh. but um, it, it, for teachers, it's not very convenient because they have to do it outside of their contract time. Yeah. Many don't have the technological skills. So even though the infrastructure might be there, um, the um, culture yes. is not there. Yeah, yeah, and the in structural conditions, right? Because you're saying, mm -hmm. if I'm done teaching, uh, the last thing that I want to do is maybe I need to go back home and, and engage yeah. with my family, <laughs> not, not yeah. more. Yeah. So. It, you have a, a really interesting position in terms of knowing the educational system in Chile. And, and I meant to ask you, because we're gonna be running out of time in a few minutes, and, and I really wanted to get your perspective. So it's kind of a two-sided two question. On the one hand, is to get your perspective on what is this particular experience of, of closure of school because of the pandemic? What is this doing to education in Chile? Is this gonna be a historical moment of before and after? Um, do you see new technologies emerging as, a, as an alternative uh, for, to continue with the instruction? So that's um, on, the, on the one hand, right? And, um, and then secondly, your perspective as to, you know the conditions on the ground in Chile very well, obviously. And um, what do you see? The question would be, uh, what is the role that education is playing and it will continue to play in, in the future of Chile? And it's a big question, but, but uh, I know that Chile is facing this very specific uh, historical, political and social moment, right? So. So I just wanted to get a little bit of your perspective. Okay, with uh, respect to the first question, um, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, lessons will be learned and, and, I, and this challenge is, is an opportunity to rethink how we organize teachers' work, for example. I've been active in, in you know, s through social media, uh, you know, helping, principles think about what does it mean to lead the return to to the new normal how yeah. do you think about that yeah. um and like you know what and i, I was reading um a, a, like an article about the fact that i was wondering you know because a big part of what principals are supposed to do is what's called instructional leadership which is how they have to work very hard at ensuring that teachers teach well and students learn but how do you do that in a virtual setting? I mean, how do you provide, how do you, and, and so I was reading and there's, I was really surprised that all the resources that are out there are for teachers and pupils and parents, but there's very, they're very, very, I haven't found really resources that will uh, tell principals or assistant principals, how do you need uh, instruction in this context? Yeah. And I found one study that was saying, you know, this, even though they're virtual schools, this is really an unexplored area, and most uh, principal preparation programs don't even address the question of how, how are you doing, you know, how are you monitoring and ensuring high quality instruction online. So mm -hmm. hopefully this is an opportunity to start thinking about, you know, what does it mean to lead 
in a, in a in a different kind of context like the one you're talking about. Yeah. I also think that um, you know, as we we know, uh, and it's well documented that because the opportunities to learn are going to be so different depending on the child's home, that when you go back to school, there's going to be a tremendous variability and diversity in terms of where kids are and so the importance of thinking about how do you deploy the capacity that exists in your schools to meet the needs of these different kids and and i think that the idea that you know each teacher will have to make continue doing what they were doing i don't think it's going to work i think teachers need to think and collaborate and more strategically so that they don't get burnt out because it's gonna be very stressful for teachers and kids really get served. So I've been, you know, sort of pushing the idea of how um, you take this opportunity to break away from some of the things that we know don't work in school. We know that teacher isolation doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, we know, for example, that when we do we have special education teachers in the schools and all they do is pull out the kid to a resource room. That doesn't work. You need greater collaboration. So how do you reorganize, for example, how special ed teachers work with regular education teachers so that differentiated instruction, for example, becomes a norm in the school and not an exception. Not or the exception, possibility yeah. yeah. As is here. So exactly. I think that those things, but I'm not sure, um, how much this is going to happen because again the whole how do you manage and the the leadership component of uh returning back to school isn't really addressed at all i mean it's very an under resourced area yeah. and i think that it, to your second question the uh, the way that education uh we, i mean you know we we know that um chile had uh you know was the first country to um use markets for educational provision so that we, we we and we've done this for 40 years and we all know that the result is tremendous segregation and inequity sure. so the previous government passed legislation to a, to address some of the uh, most more negative effects of marketization yeah and also to strengthen public education mm -hmm. by uh, returning, devolving the responsibility of public schools to the state rather than to the municipal governments. Mm -hmm. um, but the current government doesn't believe in in those policies. But so they're they're implementing policies that they don't believe in. Yeah. So yeah. To, to what extent how that's going to be resolved it remains an issue yeah. uh, because I think we do not resolve that tremendous social segregation that we have in our school systems, the inequities that exist and that are, are, are exacerbated by the, the school closure, um, you know, we will not be able to um, give kids the opportunity that they all deserve. Mm -hmm. and, and so much talent is going to go to waste. You know, we have so many talented children who really don't have an opportunity to um, develop it and 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 you know contribute to society, yeah. Yeah. Uh, whether they're marginalized. So I think that um, hopefully you know the the questions of inequity will be much more at the forefront of policymakers' yeah. um, minds when they figure out how we're going to return. Uh, but again. Um, you know, and what's so interesting is that despite the fact that you from from within you see all these issues that need to be tackled in the rest of Latin America, we always look up at Chile as this wonderful country with all this innovation, all this incredible capacity. So I'm really certain that um, even though the challenges are tremendous, uh, uh, Chile has always come up with the wonderful amazing solutions because of the quality of, of its people and and you know i'm, I'm really I, I, we've been seeing this historically so I, I carmen i i need to close this but i really wanted to to send you my my greetings my my solidarity from other places 
and hoping that Chile will come out of this uh, strengthened in, in many ways. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. It's been fun, and I can't believe time sort of went fast. So fast, um, exactly. Yeah. And, and I think it's important for, um, as you say, to, to see what we were thinking at the time, and then maybe in, in retrospect, we'll say, oh, why didn't we think of this? You know, why yeah. we do that? The main thing is that, you know, we learn from this, but I'm not sure if we will necessarily learn the right things. Yeah. Carmen, muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much. A ti, te muy bien. Gracias. Thank you, gracias.